Good morning and welcome to morning worship from St Peter's Church in Ipsley on Thursday the 16th of September. It's really good you could um, join worship with me again this morning. O oh Lord, open our lips and our mouths shall proclaim your praise. Bless the Lord, all you works of the Lord. Sing his praise and exalt him forever. Bless the Lord, you heavens. Sing his praise and exalt him forever. Bless the Lord, you angels of the Lord. Sing his praise and exalt him forever. Bless the Lord, all people on earth. Sing his praise and exalt him forever. O people of God, bless the Lord. Sing his praise and exalt him forever. Bless the Lord, you priests of the Lord. Sing his praise and exalt him forever. Bless the Lord, you servants of the Lord. Sing his praise and exalt him forever. Bless the Lord, all you of upright spirit. Bless the Lord, you that are holy and humble in heart. Bless the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Sing his praise and exalt him forever. The night has passed and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O oh God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. Well, today in the Church of England calendar, we remember Ninian. Bishop of Galloway. Now, Ninian is one of the most venerated saints of Scotland. He is commemorated as Apostle of the Southern Picts. Few details of his life and activities of uh, St Ninian are unknown, although he is mentioned in the writings of the Venerable Bede. Ninian was possibly the first Bishop of Galloway, and during his life, St Ninian worked many miracles, which continued through his prayers after his death in the first half of the fifth century, probably about 432. According to a legend, at the moment of St Ninian's repose, a bell began to ring by itself, announcing the death of the righteous man and calling everyone to his deathbed. St Ninian was buried in a stone coffin near the altar of the church that he had built on the Whitehorn Peninsula, southwest Scotland, uh, the centre of his missionary activities. And pilgrims flocked to his relics up until about the 16th century Reformation. And we're going to read the collect for today. So let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who called your servant Ninian to preach the gospel to the people of Northern Britain, raise up in this and every land heralds and evangelists of your kingdom that your church may make known the immeasurable riches of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And our first reading today is Psalm 79 verses 1 to 10. So that's Psalm 79, verses 1 to 10. O 
Oh God, the nations have invaded your inheritance. They have defiled your holy temple. They have reduced Jerusalem to rubble. They have left the dead bodies of your servants as food for the birds of the sky, the flesh of your own people for the animals of the wild. They have poured out blood like water all around Jerusalem and there is no one to bury the dead. We are objects of contempt to our neighbours, of scorn and derision to those around us. How long, Lord, will you be angry forever? How long will your jealousy burn like fire? Pour out your wrath on the nations that do not acknowledge you, on the kingdoms that do not call on your name. For they have devoured Jacob and devastated his homeland. Do not hold against us the sins of past generations. May your mercy come quickly to meet us. For we are in desperate need. Help us, God our Saviour, for the glory of your name. Deliver us and forgive our sins for your name's sake. Why should the nations say, where is their God? Before our eyes, make known among the nations that you avenge the outpoured blood of your servants. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. Well, imagine that, that we had travelled back in time and today we see the city of Jerusalem. A city destroyed, just like the city destroyed in Psalm 79. And as we, as we read, O oh God, the nations have invaded your inheritance. They have defiled your holy temple. God's people are in a terrible state. Jerusalem has been reduced to rubble and there is no one to bury the dead. The scene around Jerusalem is one of horror. The temple has been destroyed. The city is in ruins. And the army is a mass of decaying corpses providing food for wild birds and animals. Shame is added to sorrow through the insults heaped on Israel by its neighbours. Verses one to four. The, the psalmist has written with such heartfelt emotion that he could be standing right next to us as he pleads for compassion. And like in a previous psalm of ourself, Psalm 79 is from the time of Jerusalem's destruction and the taking of the people into captivity. The destruction of Jerusalem has been judgment sent by God on the nation because of its sin. But, ask the people, is not that enough? Will God now reverse his judgment and punish those who eat up the people, verses five to seven. They pray that God will forgive their sins and restore them to their land. In this way, he will silence those nations who mock him as being powerless to save, verses eight to 10. God's captive people cry out to him to rescue them and punish those who insult him. Verses 11 to 13. The people cry to God for some decisive action that will save them from their pleasant, from their present plight. They are weighed down with grief. God has apparently forgotten them and their enemies cruelly mock them. And as we reflect on this song, what could God be teaching us here? 
Well, one lesson that stands out clear for me is that it is right. It is not only common sense, but it is so right to simply accept God's gift of his son. Be thankful and continue to praise God for his mercy by accepting God's gift of his son. We are right with him and life is good. Otherwise, we are separated and life is one big, unsettling letdown. People might doubt what God can do, but it's really simple. It's all about praying, being a good person, working hard, doing our best, using common sense and accepting the love of God in Christ. Let us be thankful that we can ask for forgiveness in Jesus's name and our sins are forgiven. Then God's loving kindness is with us and our future days with him are victorious because no matter what happens in life, God loves us. And at the end of the day, that is all that matters, that God loves us. Our second reading is Philippians 2, verses 12 to 30. Philippians 2, verses 12 to 30. Do everything without grumbling. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure. Children of God without fault, in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labour in vain. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you, so you too should be glad and rejoice with me. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I may also be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope therefore to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. But I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you take to take care of, who you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad, and I may have less anxiety. So then, welcome him in the Lord with great joy, and honour people like him because he almost died for the work of Christ, 
he risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we've been reading through Philippians this week, chapter from chapter 1, verse 27 to chapter 2, verse 11, Paul has been encouraging the Philippians to conduct themselves in a manner wholly worthy of the gospel. He has been teaching about unity, harmony and humility. And he has highlighted Christ's example of perfect obedience and self-sacrifice. With all this in mind, Paul urges the Philippians to obediently put this teaching into practice. And from chapter 2, verse 12, Paul explains to the Philippians how he explains to the Philippian church how to apply what he has been teaching them. And Paul continues his letters with some practical advice. Do everything without complaining or arguing, verse 14. Now there is something slightly awry about a Christian who always seems to have a pessimistic outlook on life or a conscientious, restless demeanor. Paul doesn't want the Philippian Christians to be whiners and complainers. He wants them to be joyful by refraining from grumbling and complaining and dissension. The Philippians would prove themselves to be blameless and innocent in contrast with the surrounding pagan society. Back in Moses' time, the Israelites had been guilty of complaining not only had they grumbled and complained about Moses, they also grumbled and complained about God. God took these sins very seriously. And you can read those stories in Exodus and Numbers. While we need to honestly face problems and difficulties and not dismiss them with blind optimism, we need to be wary about being pessimistic complainers whining gossips or promoters of dissension and Paul was not exaggerating, exaggerating when he described the Philippian society as warped and crooked but rather than feel intimidated by the pagans and cowering and hiding from their society Paul wanted the Philippians to shine like stars he wanted them to appear as luminaries in the world so that their testimony and behaviour would shine brightly to all those around them and thus be witnesses for Jesus Christ. And um, if we remember Jesus' teaching in Matthew 5 verses 14 to 16, it's something very similar. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your father in heaven. And since his conversion to Christianity, Paul had invested his life in the cause of the gospel and he wanted his ministry to have an eternal lasting effect. Paul describes the real possibility that his life and ministry were coming to an end through the sacrifice of martyrdom but his earnest hope was not that he would be acquitted of his death sentence. His real hope was that his ministry and labour would not prove to be in vain, empty and meaningless. And in his second letter to Timothy, Paul used similar imagery of ritual sacrifice to describe his impending martyrdom. However, 
in his letter to Timothy, Paul expressed more optimism about the success of his ministry. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. And that's 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 to 8. And in the Philippians passage today, in verses 17 to 18, Paul picks up the theme of joy again, and he urges mutual rejoicing, even in the face of death. He encouraged the Philippians to be bold and joyful and continue his ministry of the gospel. I am glad and rejoice with all of you, so you too should be glad and rejoice with me. And we come to a time of prayer. And we pray for the church. Let's pray. We pray for the church throughout the world that she may be a visible sign of God's love, reaching out to all people in solidarity and service. We pray that the church may become a sign of hope and a beacon of light in the darkness. Today in the diocesan diary, we pray for the wire forest team. We pray for all those couples who were due to get married in their churches last year. We pray for those who have rearranged their weddings for this year, that their plans are able to go as smoothly as possible. Our hearts particularly go out to those who have had to move their weddings into 2022. And we pray for their ALMs, their volunteers and their PCCs. And we pray for their clergy, Sally Butcher. We pray for the persecuted church. Support those, O oh, oh Lord, who fear violence at uttering the name of Jesus. We pray for the underground Christian churches everywhere. May they thrive until a time when all will speak openly of Jesus. We pray for Christian martyrs in the world today, in places where speaking the name of Jesus means certain death. Hear the prayers of those who abide with you in dangerous times and in dark valleys and who die with your name on their lips. Draw them quickly to your side where they might know eternal peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the people of the world. We pray for all people facing extreme weather, storms, floods, droughts, and other natural disasters, that you, Lord, may grant them courage in difficult times and the practical help that they need. And we do so thank you for the world aid agencies working to ease the distress of so many. We pray for everyone who does not have access to enough food or clean water, those without electricity, education, or free health care, that they might see a future, might see a brighter future for themselves and for their, for their children. We pray for all who live surrounded by conflict, war and lasting injustice. We pray for all those who feel lonely, anxious or depressed. For those who mourn and for all those who are struggling with financial or family worries at this time. May God grant us all the light of hope and the knowledge of his love for each and every one of us. And we pray for world leaders that you might grant them the wisdom to make just decisions that lead to peace 
and the compassion to take practical action for those in most need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for those who are sick, for those known to us, for those mentioned in the weekly catch, for those with no one to pray them, for them only you know, Lord. For those who really want to be better, but the hours of testing, diagnosing, and question marks that pop up concerning their future all seems to be a bit too much for them to handle. And we pray for all who are mourning the death of a loved one at this time and for all who are missing someone special. May you, Lord, bring the light of hope and the comfort of your love into the lives and hearts of all who suffer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we say together the prayer that Jesus himself taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless us and preserve us from all evil and keep us in life eternal. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, thank you for joining with me again this morning. And I do look forward to joining you tomorrow when our readings will be Psalm 86 verses 1 to 17 and Philippians 3. That's Psalm 86, 1 to 17 and Philippians 3. Look forward to seeing you then.